This is the Mile High Five podcast with Carl Jensen and Doug Cunnington. We have authentic conversations about the journey to Phi, health, happiness, and some very odd tangents. We interview Phi experts, side hustlers, people on their way to Phi, and those who have reached the other side. Join us every week, and if you want the show notes and links and all that other stuff, head over to milehighfi.com. Hello, it's Doug here, and I wanted to give a quick intro for this episode. We recorded it last summer during the, quote, extraordinary event. That was the name of the event. Alan and Katie Donegan put on this sort of, I guess it was a workshop and kind of a retreat and a lot of social community activities last summer. And it was very fun. Carl and I recorded a lot of it. And we also did a live panel. So Mr. Money Mustache, Alan Donegan, and Carl were on the panel. They fielded live questions from the live studio audience. And I was behind the camera recording. So we are rebroadcasting this. This is actually from maybe 50 episodes ago, something like that. It was a while back when we published it. But we have run into a little bit of a scheduling issue. So we actually have a lot of interviews lined up. They're already recorded, they're edited, but uh, Carl has a little cold. So we weren't able to get together in the last week or so to do the shorter Friday episode. Now, that said, we weren't planning on rebroadcasting this particular weekend, but in the future, we actually will rebroadcast occasionally. Once you have a a whole lot of episodes and then Carl and I traveling and doing other stuff over the summer, we're probably going to have a rebroadcasted episode here or there. Additionally, and I haven't recorded it yet, but additionally, we may do some like guest uh, host to come and join me or maybe join Carl when the schedule doesn't allow for us to get together. And hopefully, you know, in the future, we'll, we're planning a little bit further ahead. But as you probably gathered from many of the other episodes, we're just flying by the seat of our pants. We're having a nice time when we can get together. Sometimes some weeks we'll record like four or five episodes and we have a really nice backlog to work through. And other times we're recording uh, just days before it goes live. So this was a fantastic episode. A lot of interaction again with the audience and Pete and Alan and Carl going back and forth. So really fun episode. And I hope you enjoy it. Shoot us uh, an email. What what are our emails? I think it's carl at milehighfi.com or doug at milehighfi.com. If you have any questions, we're going to be doing some mailbag episodes pretty soon. And I'll also mention that we have been getting a couple pitches for case studies. So we did uh, the Lewis and Clark case study a little while back. We have a couple more um, that we're looking at. So if you have a maybe an interesting story, especially if you're on the journey to FI, maybe you have some questions that You've heard people talk about, maybe we've covered it before, but you want to hear uh, directly from us for your particular situation. There's always nuance with these things, and we understand that. The Lewis and Clark episode was wildly popular, and I'm glad people checked it out. So if you have any ideas for either a case study or you have questions, and we do encourage questions that are on topic for FI and personal finance, but we also like irrelevant questions that may take us on a tangent. Sometimes those could be uh, the most exciting part of the episode. So thanks a lot. I'm going to send it over to, I think Carl is going to take it from here and he'll do a little intro and uh, bear with us. It sounds a little, um, you know, we're in an echoey room at Mr. Money Mustache HQ. There's a lot of brick and I mean, it's a great space, but for audio, I mean, I'm no pro and I, I do the best that I can, but if there's a little echo or if it's hard to hear, usually we would try to repeat the question and make sure it's very clear what they're talking about. Plus from, I mean, from context, you should be able to figure it. Okay. Let's send it to the episode now and I'll, uh, I'll see you. I'll see you next time. Uh, yeah. So we're recording it for something. We don't entirely know why, but we're going to work that out afterwards. Because we're narcissistic. Everything exactly. we say is worth recording. It's very important. Yeah. <laughs> um, Carl, 
Yeah. Has everyone thought of a good question to ask Alan and Pete? Sure. <laughs> if you don't have one, just borrow something. I'm going to date myself here. Borrow something from the movie Airplane. Have you, do you remember that? Have you ever been in a Turkish prison? <laughs> okay, so how this is going to work is I have a short story and question for each of these because I'm selfish and I want to ask my own question. And then I'll turn it over to you so you'll be able to ask a question. I'll repeat it and then they will hopefully answer it. Yeah. So Doug and I have a friend named Chris who we were talking to a couple weeks ago. And our friend Chris is a successful entrepreneur guy. And he was talking about this venture capital guy who was going to give him a bunch of money. And I think this venture capital guy was uh, nine figure net worth, like hundreds of millions. Did I do that right? I think so. Yeah. My math is sloppy. And this venture capitalist guy comes in and says, oh, well, I'm going to give you this money and I'm going to tell you one other thing. This is going to be the happiest time of your life. It's all downhill after this. So here's this guy worth hundreds of millions of dollars telling these people that it's all downhill from here after he gives them the money. The guy's like, my life isn't happy now. I've got, I've bought all this stuff and my life is complex. So I thought that was kind of strange. And I was thinking about Pete and I've got this other friend who I was at a conference and he's like, you know that Pete, the mustache guy, right? I'm like, yeah, where's this going? He's like, can I, ask, can I ask you a question about him? I'm like, okay. He's like, he isn't really like he says it on the blog, right? Because he's got money and people who have money don't do all the stuff that he says he does on the blog. Like he doesn't actually do that stuff, right? Like ride his bike and build his own stuff. I'm like, well, a couple months ago, Pete was like, hey, you want to come help me out with a project? So I'm like, sure. And I didn't ask what the project was. And it was moving uh, bucket loads of or wheelbarrow loads of cement to build your studio in your backyard. So I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That was like years ago, right? It, but, it was yeah. a long time ago. So that was probably the most physically strenuous day of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a time lapse of it on YouTube still. You can still watch Carl to this day. like Sweating. Yeah, yeah, probably laying on the ground before the ambulance <laughs> shows up. So I'm like, yeah, Pete is who he says he is. And he's probably more than that. <laughs> I've lived through it. So I, I go back and I think about this often because uh, I found Mr. Money Mustache and it was great. At, and I'm sure a lot of you have similar stories, but Pete gave me permission to be a little bit different and that was to retire early. But the other thing, which I think has equal value, which I don't think most people think about, is he also told me it's okay to stay the same too. Just because you've got, you're at a certain place in life, you don't have to go crazy and do stupid shit. It's okay to still buy your shirts and underwear at Costco. So yeah. I appreciate that. And that's a <laughs> <laughs> Or the thrift store. We've got some great thrift stores. We should have had a thrift store experience here. Do they have here. underwear there at the thrift store? I draw the line there. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, the difference between this guy who has infinite money, and they both have infinite money at this point, is that uh, Pete keeps his life simple and this other guy does not. And there's a lot of value and a lot of happiness. And no matter where your life takes you, keeping it simple and the same. So I'll shut up now and ask my question to Pete. <laughs> so this is something I've always wanted to ask you. Um, and I think I know the answer to it already. So I'll see if you have the answer that I think you'll say. When you started Mr. Money Mustache, did you ever think it would become the phenomenon? It's a weird word, but it, as big as it is now, did you think that? I mean, we're sitting in your headquarters, right? It's our headquarters, Carl. It is ours, but I'm like 1% <laughs> and you're 99%. Uh, no, 33 each, owners. Um, so to really answer your question, though, um, no, of course not. That would be ridiculous expectation. <laughs> But I definitely um, always have like a bit of naive optimism for everything I do where I think like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if this happened? Like that's why like with this car-free city I keep talking about, like there's, there's the realistic thing of like maybe nobody will move in, but then there's the stretch goal of like it will change urban design worldwide forever and fix climate change and car culture and all this stuff too. So I kind of think both, I always think of both things as being possible but you don't set your sights on the big thing being possible. Like, you know, you're not sad if it doesn't happen, but you just know that it could happen and then you kind of take steps towards it happening. Okay. I thought you would say it was going to be huge because of the magic of thinking big, but it's fine. Yeah, that's true. I mean, that, that book would, would tell you to think that. And I, you know, like, but some people, they cut it off before even thinking there's a possibility of big. And I think that's where that book and, you know, that's the magic is you can still think big even while you're not like sad if everything doesn't turn into magic. 
lucky lottery ticket. Cool. Okay, I've got one more story about Alan and a question for Alan. And then I will let you all ask questions and I will shut up. Um, so the story with Alan is I met him in Ecuador in 2017 and I was kind of intimidated by him. I saw him shouting together everyone for breakfast, for dinner, I think it was. It was dinner, so I'm yeah. like, yeah, that guy's a little intimidating. And I was much more introverted back then. So I'm like, I'm just going to avoid him. And then I started talking to him. <laughs> I only found this out this week. <laughs> so I think Wednesday, we got there on Saturday, and finally on Wednesday I talked to you. We were sitting there at breakfast, and then you gave a talk uh, the next night. I think it was Thursday night. And this was unusual because Alan was not a speaker at the Chautauqua. I think it's probably the only time it's ever happened that an attendee is given a presentation. So Alan gives up there, and I don't even remember what your presentation was about. But I remember it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I was on, on this trip too. Is you, that the one? You were on the trip. I also yeah. met Alan. Yeah. yeah okay. you, do you remember what his presentation yeah. was about? I mean, or? he basically just gave uh, how to start a business with no debt. It was kind of like the super packaged elevator pitch for pop up business school, the bigger thing. But because you're so interesting and, and good at summarizing stuff, everybody was blown away and they felt like they had taken a two week pop up business school course, even though you just kind of made it up on the spot. And uh, yeah, and that's what led to. Alan coming to the United States and doing all this stuff because we all wanted him to come and yeah. be, you know, make us look cool by being, by speaking in our places. Yeah. And I wanted to come. Yes, that too. That helped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so public speaking always scared the shit out of me because we're taught how to do it wrong in college. Like, I don't know if you had a public speaking class, but we're taught to put our like three points on a note card and we go up there and we stand behind the podium and here's our introduction and here's our main points and we read off these things and it's the most boring ass way to give a presentation in the world. But then there's Alan who could talk about staplers for an hour and a half and make it, everyone would be totally engaged. So do that, staplers, our next talk. And, and public speaking scared the shit out of me. I know it scares the shit out of most people, but me more than most, which I'll get to in a second. So at the end of the week, I told Alan, I'm like, Alan, you've inspired me. If I ever get a chance to public speak, I'm gonna take it and try to apply your lessons. And when I said that, it was a pretty empty promise because who the hell's gonna want me to public speak? And I swear this happened like a month after I get back, this professor from CSU sends me an email. She's like, yeah, I'd really like you to come talk to my students. I'm like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, universe. <laughs> and I was like, I could just delete this and not tell Alan, but I'm like, I have to do it. I have to do it. I promised Alan that if I had a chance, I would do it. And I remember driving up there, my wife was driving up there. I'm like, you have to help me out with this. I can't do this alone. And she's driving up there, and I, I look at my leg, and, and my leg is shaking because I'm so nervous. I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be good. This is so scary. And, and, and then I get to where the thing is going to be, and there's this big podium. So I'm like, okay, Mindy, I'm going to stand behind the podium so they don't see my leg shaking, and you're going to stand right there. And we gave the talk, and it wasn't too bad. It was probably pretty shitty, but so. <laughs> But it wasn't as shitty as I thought it could have been. So then I decided to volunteer for more and more, and I got better at public speaking. But the main part about it was I got I became a better person, more confident, less introverted, and it's all because Alan and I and I saw him speak. So I'm so thankful for that. These two people are inflection points in my life, and I hope they are for you too, if they're not already. So my big question for you, Alan, is this is shocking because we've seen Alan talk. I've never seen a better public speaker in my life. But when we interviewed you for the podcast, Doug back there, hi Doug, <laughs> Doug and I have a podcast, Alan said he was a not confident kid and I'd like you to, if you're okay with it, to tell this story because I think it's inspirational because you're this amazing person today, but you struggled probably more than any of us as a child and I'd like you to talk about that and how you made the change to the person you are today. That's a big question, isn't it? <laughs> There will be time for y'all, I swear. I just struggled as a kid. I didn't fit in. I was overweight. I had glasses. I was nervous. I didn't fit in. I got bullied heavily. And I hated, hated school. And I, I was shy when I was a kid. I, I remember being at a Chinese meal with my parents. And I love Chinese food. Um, and we were eating Chinese food. And mum's like, there's a piano player he's asking for song recommendations like take this five pounds as a tip and go and go and ask for a song 
And I was like, nope. And she's like, do it. Nope. And there was this like massive battle to get me to go and talk to anyone. And that was probably the internal battle that I had for the first 20 years of my life. And then I, even later on, that story Carl tells of me at the Chautauqua shouting at everyone, I have a completely different version of that story. <laughs> uh, my wife and I turned up, not late, but like just before the meal was going to be served. And everyone was already there in groups. And I didn't know how to break into the groups. So Katie and I stood on the side, like nervous. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know any of these people. I don't know who to talk to. And I, I, I remember saying to her, can we just go? Like, I just want to go back to the room. I do not want to be here. And then this little Ecuadorian lady, she was tiny, came out and tried to get all of the loud Americans' attention to have dinner. And no one heard her. No one. So I was like, fine, I'll help. So in my very loud British voice, I was like, ladies and gentlemen, dinner is served. Uh, and I did it because I was trying to help. And because I either did it or I ran. It was like, those were my two choices. Um, and then everyone came in, we sat at tables and it was better because I, like, I sat next to people. But Carl saw me as this big shouty person to avoid. <laughs> and I was just desperately trying to fit in. And I think it's really interesting. You never know the struggles that someone's going through, even if they seem confident on the outside. Yeah. Okay, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you'll say your question, I'll repeat it, and then... <clears throat> My question's for all three of you. Uh, did you coordinate your beard styling prior to... <laughs> Naturally. Um, Lance has a softball. Uh, Did we match. coordinate our facial they? hair? <laughs> yeah. They do not match. Uh, I'd never had a beard until 2019, and then someone told me that it was acceptable. Yeah. Um, we like your, the new Alan better. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. Very acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too, Pete. <laughs> it looks great from the lady perspective. Mm -hmm. Terry. Mm -hmm. Ellen and I did decide to get matching haircuts, though. Oh, yeah, okay. I see. Kind of, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. David. Uh, I mean, question once again for all three of you. You've all, I would say, in manner, shape, or form, left a legacy already in the things you've done so far. I mean, you've improved a lot of people's lives. But <laughs> what's next? What's, what's the next thing for, for you guys? So David's question is that we all have left a legacy. We've all done stuff to help people. What is next for us? Ellen? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to tell you what you're doing next, Carl? <laughs> I can do. Uh, next for me, uh, building the podcast, The Board You Can't Afford, season three. Like, the mission is to change the way entrepreneurship is taught around the world and to help people build businesses, and that's what I want to do. Um, I'm working on a TV show, which... Like, I'm hoping to get out there on a similar subject, although that is a rocky journey of joy. Um, and then I just want to, like, hang out with cool people, have fun and have a lot of breakfast. <laughs> Occasionally play with Lego. Like, just want to have fun. Yeah, and you've taken my... I'll go a second just because you have my answer already. I'm mostly just on a day-to-day -day program where I already have enough fun stuff going on and I just want to make sure I make the most of it and make less wasted days and more pleasant, useful days and just get a little bit productive things done each day. So I don't really have any huge goals. I just want to enjoy a bunch of nice days. Uh, yeah, another not too sexy answer. I'm building a shed in my backyard if any of you are yeah. available next week. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the concrete I hear that I'm in. <laughs> Appreciate that. Yeah, you can yeah. return the favor four years mm -hmm. later. Uh, yo, yo quiero aprender español. I'm trying to learn Spanish. Um, I'm working on a Chopin piece on the piano. For the longest time, you know how that guy's name is spelled? The Chopin composer? Chopin. Yeah, C-H-O-P-I-N. It took me like till 43 to realize that. Mm -hmm. Chopsticks. Uh, I, I guess the thing, if there's any part that faces y'all, it's working on a podcast with Doug, which I'm having a lot of fun doing in the 
main purpose of that is to learn how to become a better public speaker. Doug is very good, and I observe him and learn from him, although he hasn't said anything this whole time. <laughs> Thanks for the compliment. <laughs> Sometimes less is more. <laughs> Mies van der Rohe. <laughs> if you don't have questions, I'm going to ask some of yeah. them. It won't be pleasant. David. David. Yeah. <laughs> What's your morning routine? Oh, very Tim Ferriss question. So, so David, so David asks, "What our morning routine is?" Ellen, I'll go to you first. I guess. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I start first because I'm on the end. Uh, I've been experimenting for a couple of years with the intermittent fasting thing, so I just have some coffee because I like coffee, uh, and then have breakfast at eleven, like it's brunch. Uh, it used to be breakfast at seven a.m but not anymore, it's brunch. And then I just like to do things. I like to you know, talk to Katie about projects or write stuff or record podcasts or, yeah. I think I don't, I, this version of Alan before you has no problems with self-motivation. So I don't feel like I need a morning routine to help me do anything. Like I have no, like you do not need to motivate me in anything you need to hold me back. So I don't need to do a morning routine to be happy, to be productive. I just am. Did that make wow. sense at all? Yeah, you have a, excited. You're excited about a lot of stuff. You always have a list somewhere that you're kind of just working through. Yes, there's yeah. always stuff to do. So I'm just excited to get up and do stuff and drink coffee and talk to people. <laughs> yep, same answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a, so like, it's funny I mentioned Tim Ferriss, he's always super performance oriented. He's like, I get up and I inject a solution of oxytocin <laughs> into each eyelid and then I take out all my teeth and put in extra good teeth and then I run 60 miles at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> For me, I'm like, I never use an alarm clock. I get up whenever I wake up and then I make coffee and then I decide what I'm going to do with the day. But but it's always exciting. Like I'm always excited about each day and there's always like more stuff to do than I have time for, which is a nice situation to have. And like, you know, I could be more productive, but I realize that being more productive doesn't make you more happy. You just have to be like the right amount for you. And then I'd go for a walk, of course, and just try to have like the ingredients for a good day in each day, which includes like at least 10,000 steps of walking and some time with friends and whatever and eating good food and doing some physical labor and a bit of like computer stuff. So very like hippie, unplanned. I, oh yeah, the one thing that's weird about me is that I only, like I really rarely plan stuff in advance. So like I only decide after breakfast what I'm doing that day. And if people ask like, oh, do you want to go to dinner in two weeks? I'm like, oh, like oh, yeah. don't even ask me that. No <laughs> so like, they're like, okay, fine. I'll put on my calendar that I'll ask you after lunch that day, if you want to go to that dinner that night. And I'm like, perfect, because I, Definitely won't have plans. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Amanda knows us, right? That's my neighbors. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so I've got a couple comments of my own and then one about this guy here. Um, so I found my energy levels are highest in the morning and my brain works best. So when you're trying to learn Spanish, you're trying to pump. I think there's 89,000 words in the Spanish language and you don't need to know all of those. But I find the words stick better in my brain if I do them in the morning. I don't eat till noon, but I find I can work out more effectively before I ever eat. I kind of lose my energy after I eat. And I leave, uh, people always ask about routines, but I think the anti-routine, what he just said is, there's a lot of power to that too. And I admit this used to annoy me because I'd be like, hey, we're having this in a couple of days. And like, nope, not, not going to do anything. But now I've realized, like that's a powerful life act, just leaving your, your schedule open. And I, I wish I had something more profound to say about it. But... <laughs> like anti-planning, there's some stuff you have to plan like a vacation or things like that. But when you leave your schedule open in your day-to-day -day existence, a friend will just ping you in the afternoon. Hey, you want to go out for a bike ride and a beer? You want to go out for a hike? And now your schedule is open to uh, embrace these opportunities that happen to show up in your life. So I, I used to be mad at him and not know how to deal with him. But now I realize the value of anti-planning. That'd be a good book. If you, I don't think you want to write a book, but mm -hmm. anti-planning like would be a... Yeah. Uh, a response to all these other and it goes stuff. along with early retirement like it's true that if you have a scheduled life with business or like a job and 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 your spouse maybe has a job and your kids have schedules and you need schedules to even see your friends 
Um, but once you get rid of all that stuff, then the more spontaneous stuff is really fun. Like, hey, the creek is up today and the water's really nice and it's hot, so let's go swim on, let's go jump off the rope swing. Like, that's a lot of our neighborhood activity. And like, we wouldn't plan that days in advance, but you know, like, I'll just get a text message, we're going to the rope swing. And I'll say, yeah, I'm hot too, let's go swimming. So it's more like being a kid. And you know, adults often say, oh, kids, you know, I wish I could still be a kid again. And now I have all the responsibilities and a mortgage. Um, but that's actually a self-limiting, dumb little box that adults create. And you can totally be a kid when you're old too. And it's actually better because you have a lot more freedom as an adult um, and more money and all these other benefits of being an adult compared to kids. So like if you combine both lifestyles, I think that's the ultimate. Yeah, I think you even wrote a post about it, how spontaneous interactions with like random people are one of the, is one of the biggest indicators of happiness. Mm -hmm. And at first that seems a little weird, but now I see it in my life like Brian over there is my neighbor and I was walking around the block and all of a sudden I saw the neighbors hanging out and we all hung out and it was a fun night so there's a yeah yeah next oh Robert um, so um, this is a question I'm going to ask you guys to kind of reflect on prior to pi or early retirement uh, and kind of spinning off of that internal barrier that Alan was talking about what would you say was your biggest internal um, barrier uh, as you were pursuing by or early retirement? An intrinsic one. Um, and there's lots of community and societal ones that's kind of you know, not kind of norm or, um, but yeah, was there some sort of internal barrier that, that you struggled with as you were pursuing this? Um, you know, luckily we have lots of models and role models like you guys now to say, hey, it can be done, but you guys were kind of, you know, to the, to the sphere there. Was there an internal, intrinsic thing, like, can I do this, or a fear? And maybe there wasn't one. And if there was one, um, how did you overcome it? So Robert is asking about what the biggest internal barrier was as opposed to a societal barrier. Do you want to take this one first, Pete? Oh, yeah. My answer is really easy is that I never even knew there was a barrier. I was just like, this seems like a good idea. Let's do it. <laughs> and then I was done. And then it was like six years of being already retired before I even knew it wasn't normal to do that. And then I was like talking to my coworkers afterwards. I'm like, what do you mean? You guys still work? Like, that's weird. <laughs> what have you been doing with your money? And then that's what led me to start writing about money. Cause I assumed it was just super obvious that like you'd save your money and then stop working when you had enough. So yeah, I just kind of naively stumbled into it. No further thought processes involved, no internal battles. I'm too simple for that. <laughs> Makes me seem like a most messed up kid ever. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I had a new barrier every like five years or so. Like the first one was just confidence. Just being confident enough to talk to strangers, to do stuff. Like that was the big one. And then it was like, I wanted to do that because I wanted a girlfriend and I wasn't <laughs> confident enough to talk to strangers. And then after you get a bit more confident, it's like, what do I want to do with my life? And you try a bunch of jobs and get fired and get lost. And then you're like, what am I going to do? And that was a huge, like, what do you even want to do? And that took years to figure that out. And I hadn't even come on to money. I, that was just confidence and job. And then like later on, you kind of figure out the other stuff. And then it was getting over the fear of investing. Like that was, my dad helped me to invest all of my money in a high tech high growth fund just before the dot-com bubble. It was my life savings. Uh, and nearly all vanished and never recovered. Um, and so I was scared for maybe 15, 20 years of investing in the stock market. So that was a huge one. And life is wonderful. It always provides you with a new challenge. And it's like, oh, you've overcome that one. Here's another one. Um, but then later on in life, you go, well, that's the interesting stuff. What do I need to learn next? Uh, but that was not the case when I was younger. It was a bunch of stuff that I hated. Yeah, if I had to answer, I would say, even if you don't like your job, even if you don't like uh, it at all, it provides some certainty and structure to your life. So my biggest fear was being bored after I left to work and I'd have this big vacuum of time and what was I gonna do with it? I really, really liked the, the certainty. I liked knowing where my life would be at a point in time. And since then, it's completely flipped on, my, flipped on its head. I think the best part of life is uncertainty. I love 
not having any idea what I'm going to be doing in two or five years from now. And I think this goes back to the planning thing. It's so good to not have your chapters of your future chapters of your life all planned out to have them open, ready to embrace whatever good things come to you. So mm -hmm. that's it for me. Yeah. <clears throat> Steven? Um, I would ask one for all, all slash any of you, but does making money in itself motivate you anymore and why or why not? So Stephen asks, does making money in itself motivate you? Why or why not? Shall I go first? Yeah. Okay. Money's cool. Uh, it allows you to do cool stuff. But I've watched so many people who've got to financial independence and could stop. And they're still like their number one value is money. And they make the decisions of what to do with their life based on will this earn me money or not? And there comes a point where you've got to let go of that. Actually, money should be fairly, like it should never be above family and other stuff, but it should be fairly up your priorities when you don't have much because it will make your life better. But once you have enough, it should drop way down the list and then your decision-making should be what's going to be fun, what's going to help the world, what's going to make me grow. Um, but it takes some letting go of. And actually have met a huge number of people who can never let go of, especially in the extreme capitalist culture. Their value as a human is tied to how much money they earn. And that just, that's a never ending treadmill that you can never step off. So I think there's a change in the seasons of your life from when you do need to earn money to when you have enough and then letting go of the need to earn it and then thinking out what actually is going to be fun, make me happy. And that's why these ultra capitalists or ultra rich people will often invent more stuff to buy just because they realize, oh, I'm still making money and like, but what's the point? And there, there is no point unless you invent pointless stuff to buy and then a pretend that's important. Or? Yeah, like a yacht, like a thousand, you know, these billion dollar yachts that people make nowadays or like extra houses in every country and there's always something but really what they don't realize is that those are excuses for what to do with the money. And it's really not a very creative thing instead of just thinking like, oh yeah, the money itself is unnecessary. So let's stop thinking about it entirely. So, and I have to, I still have the habit, like, cause I was such a, I enjoyed money as a game so much as a kid and a young adult that I still get into the habit. I'm like, oh goody, look at this check. Like it's really big. I'm going to put it in the bank. Yeah, but then it turns out to be like about as fun as eating a cookie. Like as soon as it's gone, you just forget about it. So then I remind myself like, you know, don't get excited about that because it's not going to make any difference. You can do stuff with the money, like help people. Basically giving it away is the only real happiness boosting thing you can do with money when you already have more than enough for yourself. I'm trying to get better at that. But at the same time, I'm also just trying to like untrain those habits and just stop making decisions. So I have this rule for like people who have made it past that point of like when you're doing any work, you have to pretend that the pay for it is zero. Even if it does pay, you have to be like, well, would I do it for free? Mm -hmm. And if not, I won't do it. Some stuff does pay really well, even if you're lucky. So it's cool, it's fine to get paid for it, but don't let that make you decide whether or not to do it. And then similarly on the purchasing side, I tell everybody, pretend everything is free and then try to make your purchasing decisions more like that because your habits are often too frugal. So like, you know, I would catch myself a few years ago, like, Ooh, I'm just going to take the two hour bus ride to the airport because <laughs> it's $30 cheaper than taking an Uber. I'm like, no, that's stupid. Like you hate, you know, waiting at the bus station for transfers and stuff. And you like getting to the airport fast and you hate travel to begin with. So let's make it fast. And you're never gonna look at your bank account and be like, I wish I just had $30 more. <laughs> so like, just do, just take the Uber and that kind of stuff. So like, I've gotten a little bit better. I'm still not perfect. Cause sometimes when something's an outrage, I'll be like, I'm still not paying that. Like, <laughs> but um, I try, I'm at least a little bit better at like pr ignoring prices and stuff and trying to uh, buy stuff based on my values and what actually I want to do. Yeah, it's difficult. I still enjoy the game of, of making money and investing, but yeah, spending money is hard. I was uh, I told Doug the story too, and the fact that I'm telling you that means it disturbed me on a lower level. My wife and I were stuck at an airport, and she's like, well, why don't we go get a beer? There's like beer right there, and we can sit outside of this nice day and enjoy it. And I look at the price, and it was like $16 for a beer. 
And by the way, I'm saying that now, you can tell it disturbed me and continues to disturb me, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was a nice experience. We sat out there. I mean, even though the beer, and it was shitty beer, too. It wasn't even that good. But yeah, that's, uh, so that's what I struggle with. I didn't answer your question much at all. But. Yeah, but there is certain, like, you can make a compromise, right? Everyone knows that a beer is $1.25 at the beer store for good beer, right? Um, so even if you go to a restaurant, it's like five dollars. It's four times as much, four hundred percent. Like uh, it took me a lot of training to even be able to do that to buy five dollar beers, and now I buy them with abandon. But it would take a lot more <laughs> training to buy a sixteen dollar beer because, like, where's the limit? I mean, twelve hundred dollars. I can afford twelve hundred dollars, but I still wouldn't pay twelve hundred for a beer just because. Fuck you. <laughs> there has to be some line where you say fuck you because you don't like being people taking advantage of you. So anyway, I feel like it's, you know, you gotta be, you can still have limits and be reasonable with money. Yeah, I'll bet there's a bar in New York that probably sells a beer that has like gold flakes in it that probably does cost 1200 bucks. I'll bet that shit actually exists somewhere in the world. And yeah, and if it's not a beer, it's like some fancy like bartender drink at the top of a skyscraper. Chocolate margarita. Yeah, and the point is to spend more. So I, like, I never participate in the purchasing where the point is for it to be expensive, because to me that's, you know, I'm never going to go that far. <laughs> Thank you. You have a next question. So uh, the mustache and museum and the entrepreneurship are not a conventional concept that most people grow up with. But however, it involves your uh, a lot of family members, your significant partners, etc. What if you have a significant partner who's not used to the idea or not really convinced that, uh, and then I come to you and ask, like, how how should I proceed in order to kind of talk about this concept? What do you what would you say? Yeah, I've written a bunch of articles about this. Yeah. Oh, maybe I should repeat the question. Okay, so the question is saying, what if your spouse or partner is not on board with frugality and saving and mustachianism and stuff, or different level than you? Um, so the answer I thought is because like I was lucky enough to kind of have that early on from a relationship that became a marriage, and we were we never really thought about that stuff. Um, and then I heard about other people who really do have fight about that, including some of my extended family members. And so I realized how big of a problem it is in that situation. And then I got a bunch of emails and stories from people who had worked through it pretty well. And everyone's situation is different, but the ones who succeeded, they did it in a non-angry way. So it's not like, I found a receipt in your purse and that, hot, that haircut was $100. Like, no one responds well to judgment and anger. So it has to be about like selling the dream of like, hey, did you know that if we invest our money and we, you know, if we're able to invest this much, then we're going to get this much freedom in exchange and you wouldn't have to keep your job or you could have a different job or we could have kids and we could have to spend more time with them. It's like whatever your partner finds important, um, chances are that they could do more of that if, if you had a better financial situation. So then you're on board with a common goal. And then the next step is like, oh yeah, we can meet this goal if we spend less money because that's kind of, you know, you can earn more and you can spend less. And then, then they kind of are, they have something to trade off against. Because for most people who are trained in regular consuming, it's like, I can have this thing that I want or I can not have it. So they of course just choose to have it. They don't realize that there's a benefit on the other side, which is like this freedom and reduced stress and everything. So yeah, those are my two points. Less judgment, more shared goals. And then beyond that, not everybody is as flexible and some people are just like really hard to deal with and, and, and not everybody should be in the relationship they're in, to be honest. So like a lot of people probably should split up, you know, and some and other people should work it out and stay together. But you know, like those should all be on the table. Like you should try to work things out together. But then, you know, if someone's like grinding you down and you're never gonna have the same life goals, it's totally fine. There's someone out there for you that does gonna be in agreement and it's gonna be a lot happier finding a new person, especially like early in life, than you are gonna have to like endure someone's like constant clash of different life goals. So you have to be a bit brave in that situation and make a hard decision in exchange for a better life later. Yeah, so Pete kind of took my answer. I was going to say it might be easier to just go ahead and get a new spouse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think pretty much Pete pretty much nailed this. The only thing I would add is I would do what Pete said. This is really a question about values and what you want out of life. And I think most of us, despite 
where they are now, despite what they say they want, the cars and house or, or whatever, I think most people are pretty much the same. So what I would do if I was in this situation, I would say, where do you see yourself in 20 years? What do you want out of life? And I would, I would be surprised if many people said, my dream is to own blah, blah, blah car or blah, blah, blah mm -hmm. house. It would be kind of shallow. And I think if that was the case, maybe it is time to a fight flag. a new spouse. But, mm -hmm. But I don't think most people would say that. I think most people would say, well, I'd really like to be able to spend time with our kids or I really want to embrace our family and do that or I really want to live in a foreign country. And a lot of these things uh, don't cost money in themselves, but you'd have to save the money because it's all about time at that point. So you need to save the money and change what you're doing now to achieve that goal 20 years out. The one last thing I would add is about learning together. Uh, early on in Katie and my relationship, I would go to training courses and I would get super pumped by like a weekend training course. Then I would come back and try and explain to Katie what had happened in an entire weekend full of amazing experiences in 20 minutes. And she would go, uh-huh. <laughs> and not because she was bad, just because she wasn't there. And it would kill my energy and she wasn't happy. Uh, what happened to me last night. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we made a decision to go on all training courses together. That was one of the biggest things that helped us was to come to weekends like this together, to listen to the CD sets together, we do book club together, we learn together. Because I think it's difficult if one of you is stuck where you are and the other one's learning and trying to go over here and do this and do that and they're trying to bring you back. Like, that's just friction. So I think if you're going to learn, and like having a learning mindset, I think is one of the most valuable things in life. Like, maybe ask them what they would like to learn and start on their subject and learn with them. And then maybe you get the second book or the second CD set, or the second course. Uh, and then maybe you can choose that and see where it goes. But I would always learn together. I like Coral's uh, improvised seating Amy. there. Um, I'm just curious, you know, as we're all on our path to buy and we're accumulating, 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 now that you've reached by, um, how are you approaching your deaccumulation? Like 401k, Roth, uh, regular investment accounts. How are you approaching that? We're this one's for you guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Amy asks, how do you approach your investment accounts and invest data? I would say my answer is, even though we have enough at this point, I still think you should be as efficient as possible in every aspect of your life, and investing is one of that. Uh, my wife still works, so I kind of, I guess I'm kind of Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi or Spotify. <laughs> <laughs> we need to, is there a version of Fi for that? There's all a Fat Fi and all that shit, Fat Fire. Uh, maybe there needs to be Spouse Fi. So I think there's still, you should still use your money the most efficient way possible. With maybe the future plan, you need to save it so you can give away the most possible later on in life. So we still max out our 401k and we have a solo 401k, which is a more exotic version of that. So yeah, there's no use, there's no reason to be less efficient just because you have what you need, in my opinion. But I do have, so your question is probably more for like, what if someone did stop making money when they right. truly retired, right. and what would you do? And I did try to write an article about this a couple of years ago, it's called How to Live Forever on a Fixed Chunk of Money. And so I laid out what I thought would be an efficient strategy investment and tax wise. And the simple answer is like, you just set all of your dividends first to go into your grocery money account. So like that's your primary source of money. And then your second chunk of money is selling small amounts of your existing shares. Like I would suggest quarterly, you just take in the extra amount that you need that's not part of dividends, have that automatically go in. And that way stock market fluctuations aren't such a big deal. And then third, think of your retirement accounts as separate. Like if they're locked into like a penalty based account that you can't get to it later, don't worry about that at all. It's totally fine to completely use up your taxable accounts and then switch over your retirement hold when you're old enough, it's exactly the same as if they were in one pool and you were more slowly decreasing them. A lot of people think of that as not the same, but it is the same. And yeah, it all works out as long as the starting number is the right amount. And as long as your spending is in control over the years where you don't go way over your planned spending. So it's pretty, pretty easy. A lot of people don't trust it. So then they end up like 
double saving or triple saving. You know, they're like, well, I know a, a million dollars is supposed to be enough, but I'm just going to go for three just in case. <laughs> I, like, I just don't know. I don't trust the math. I don't trust. So they end up, you know, they might work like 15 extra years or 20 extra years because of a lack of this pretty safe thing, you know, a lack of trust. And that's, that would be a bad trade off in my opinion, especially if you don't like your job. Yeah, it's kind of scary because you worked your whole life accumulating, accumulating, and then to start drawing on it, it's, yeah. it's kind of scary. But you can do um, some compromises like rent out a room in your house so you feel like you have a side business or have like some other side business. Right. And you can tell yourself simultaneously, like, I don't need this job. I know the numbers. I sort of trust them. But I also like feeling in control of my income. But you, like, I think a big step is just quit your main job unless it's awesome. And that's what Carl did. He did his main job wasn't all that satisfying after a number of years. So like it was a big step to quit that for him to put words in his mouth. And then he still found plenty to do afterwards, some of which even make money. So it was like, no, you, you don't miss your main job at all now, right? No, I don't miss it at all. I've got enough activities to fill like three lifetimes. So if any of you want stuff to do, including uh, we've got to put rocks on the roof soon. That's a whole other oh, yeah. product. <laughs> Concrete slab. We need more people with wheelbarrows. <laughs> Great exercise, concrete fit. There's CrossFit, concrete fit. Yeah. Uh, Steven, and then we'll go to Keith. You can do them. Okay. Time? Yeah. How much time? Is, I don't want to bore yeah. the audience with excessive. Yeah. yeah. What time is this sitting and watching? We said six thirty, so we've okay, probably four got minutes. four to one, five minutes. One question, then one more question. All right. Because <laughs> they're long. Each one's long. Uh, I was just going to ask: uh, Was there anything once you reached by that you weren't expecting? Like you, you know, as people that are pursuing it still is like we have this you know uh, kind of idealized version of what it's going to be like was there anything that came up that you were like oh maybe if i'd done that i would have done something differently or anything to that effect okay i can summarize the question for you carl Stahl. okay the question is is there anything different or unexpected about post-fi life that you wish you'd known in advance is that a fair yeah, yeah. summary okay now, who wants to answer it? <laughs> I'll say I'll talk about this a little bit more tomorrow in my talk, but I thought as soon as I reached financial independence, uh, it would rain beer and I'd see unicorns and there'd be rainbows and I'd all of a sudden be happier and then I was kind of pretty much the exact same shit. Uh, and it was because I was relying on this external circumstance to change my life. With that said, uh, this set me on uh, a big journey to figure out what happiness is about and figure out what I'm doing wrong. And I'm in a much better place now. So I'm trying to make some grand point here. Uh, so it's really, really good now. It's much better than I expected it would be now, but it took a couple of years to figure it out. It's not a magic pill and fire should not be this goal that you're aiming for. Money is just a tool to figure out the rest of your life and it should be nothing more than that. Yeah, I agree with that. So you're, you're the same person. So most of your problems don't go away. The only difference is that you can, if you quit your job, then you get those hours back in your day. So that's one thing. And then if the job was stressful, then that piece of stress is also gone from your day. But everything else is the same. So then you have to decide what to do with the extra free time. And if you fill it with stuff that's not very good, like watching TV or worrying or anything else that's not enriching your life, then your life could actually be worse than it was pre-fi and pre-job quitting. But on the other hand, if you're if you do stuff like I always focus on production, I always tell people focus on production, not consumption. So if you say like I'm gonna quit my job and watch more TV, that's a recipe for failure because you're just consuming passive entertainment. Even when people say I'm gonna quit my job and go on a bunch of cruises and like really leisure based travel, um, it's unlikely to be satisfying for most people because again you're consuming you're not putting as much work into those things as you would um, like starting a, helping people or starting a business or something that's like cre using your creativity and effort. So anyway, the reason I think Carl and also me um, have more fun lives now than before is because we're doing a bunch of stuff that involves people like by writing on websites, for example, like blogs, it, that part is a bit boring, but if you actually get to meet people because of it, then it's good. So that's why we put all this work into making events like this happen because this is where like the real sparks of a better life happen. It's like for us, it's people, 
and doing stuff that's kind of hard and challenging to work on. And then it can be better. Yeah, it can be better than employed life. I had exactly the same experience as Carl, but from a different starting point. Like nothing particularly changed, but I loved what I did before. Then I just had the freedom to do it on my own schedule. So I did less of it, so I had more time with my wife, more time traveling, more time stuff. But I still love what I do, like running courses and helping people. I just didn't have to do it every Monday morning at 9 a.m. with really bad traffic. I got to choose when I had to do it. So I think so many people run away from jobs without knowing what they're running towards. I think you would have a much better transition from pre to post fi if you loved what you were doing and already had a side project, a fun thing, something that really lights you up, something enjoyable. I don't care what it is. Pizza's construction. Carl's got Spanish and all sorts of things going on and construction is so much. Like they've got that now, but I think if you have that already, like run a bunch of mini experiments, figure out what you love to do before you quit. Then when you do quit, you're like, oh, I've got all this free time to do this cool stuff. And then you, you won't even feel it. You'll just be so excited because there's so much written about the painful quitting bit and the problems that come from it. I think if you have so much cool stuff to get excited about doing, you will never have that. Like I always call it the weekend test. I, if people are thinking of quitting their jobs, I ask, what do you do on the weekend right now? And because you're just... The only difference is you're going to have a seven day weekend every week. So is that good or not good based on how you're currently spending your weekends? And uh, if you're already like energized and doing stuff on the weekends, that's pretty productive and you want more of that, then that's a good candidate to like at least reduce your job or quit entirely. But if you're just like decompressing, like, oh, okay, you know, like just drinking and sitting on the couch because your job is so bad, then it's more of a blank. You don't know what's going to happen because you're not currently using your weekends for anything other than like, you know, recovering, but you can't just like recover seven days a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had such a big list of things I wanted to do when I had more time that I was so excited to get on with it, so excited. And then doing that movie project is the first thing. It's like, this is amazing. I can drink coffee. There's sunshine in LA, like who knew that existed? Um, and I wrote stuff and it's just incredible. And I think if you've got stuff to be excited about, it will be amazing. If you don't have stuff to be excited about, you're gonna be very bored and feel depressed. Yay. Good answer, good question. I told you that would be long enough because it's 6.32 and uh, I don't want to like over sit ever our welcome. So I think we should say thank you so much for the super good questions. And obviously we can keep hanging out. The night is still young. Thanks a lot to Pete and Alan and Carl for sitting in the panel and all the people that asked questions. It was a really fun event. And I encourage you, if you get a chance to go to a live event like that, do it, whether it's the extraordinary event kind of deal or Camp Fi or Economy or even FinCon or something like that, definitely check it out. The community is really awesome. I mean, people are very welcoming. It is a little, I guess, maybe like a summer camp or the first day of school or something. And to be fair, I never went to summer camp, so I only know what it's like from maybe the 80s movies that I saw in my youth. And I, I mean, camp kind of looks like fun. I'm getting pretty far off topic here. But the, the point is, you may not know anyone. You might only know one or two people. But the cool part is you're probably going to have a chance to talk to almost everyone, depending on how big the event is. But it's very cool because everyone is so welcoming and they want to meet you and hear your story. And even if you're maybe a little more introverted or a little quiet, you know, you have the ability to talk as much as you want or as little as you want. No one's going to pressure you or anything like that. So it's just a very uh, low stress, low pressure environment where we're all into the same kind of stuff. So I hope you enjoyed this live Q&A. And one sort of fun part is while Carl's gone, I could just talk and uh, I'll tell you a little story. I'm a little nervous because the day that this episode will come out, 
Friday the 13th, May the 13th, I will be under the needle. I will be getting the Mile High Fi tram stamp. No, not, it's, not, it's not a tram stamp and it won't be Mile High Fi, but I am indeed getting a tattoo in just a couple days. So when you're listening to this, if you listen to it on the day it comes out, there's a good chance that I will be getting a tattoo at that very moment. So you can think about me and think about how I am writhing in pain. I'm sitting there thinking, when is this going to be over? My fight or flight instincts are kicking in and I'm thinking, I got to get up out of this chair and go somewhere else, maybe have a cold beer, but it'll be fun. I am very excited. I am nervous. My hands are getting sweaty right now just thinking about it, but it's all going to be, uh, it's going to be just fine. And even if you're, if you're, uh, you know, listening to it sometime in the future, um, at least for the next couple of weeks, it will be healing and I'll be in pain then too. Not, not as bad. It's really bad when you're getting it. It's been years since I got a tattoo anyway, but it should be fun. Should be fun. I will be under the needle coming up soon and I'll leave it at that. So we'll catch you on the next episode and have a great day or evening or afternoon or weekend or whatever time of day it is where you're at. Thanks for listening to the show. That was the Mile High Five podcast and I'm Doug Cunnington, the balder host, and Carl Jensen is the cool, sexy one. If you dig the show, please do three things for us. Number one, tell a friend, a family member, an enemy about the show. We really don't care who you tell. Maybe forward them a specific show that you know that they will like. It's the single most helpful thing that you can do to spread the word. It's like giving us a virtual high five and uh, actually we don't give high fives in, in person. So the virtual kind is pretty good. And more importantly, your friend or family member or even your enemy will appreciate the fact that you were thinking of them. Number two, make sure you're following or subscribed on your podcast app, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, YouTube, whatever you're using. And that way you won't miss a show. And number three, please leave us a rating and review. We read them on the show occasionally, and you might hear yours out there on an upcoming episode. Quick disclaimer, this show is not financial or legal advice. I'd actually be surprised if it sounded like it. It's really just for entertainment, and that's at least what we're hoping for. But seriously, get advice from professionals. Carl and I are just two guys with microphones that sit in my basement and talk. So we'll catch y'all next week.